dome of St. Peter's rises upwards like a heavenly choir. Michael Snell, the founder of Catholicism for the Modern World. We are a multimedia apostolate that seeks to connect Catholic creators and companies, launching a new Catholic renaissance. Tonight on I Am Live, we will be taking a look at the Synod on Synodality. We will also be having a creator spotlight on John C. Price. He is the current president of the Fatima Family Apostolate. Next, an appearance by a well-known Catholic speaker. Music, prayer, all of this and more on I Am Live with the intercession of St. Isidore of Seville and Blessed Carlo Acutis, the two patrons of the internet. Isidore Acutis Media seeks to be a great tool for evangelization. Now thank you all for watching and may God bless you. Yeah, record. We'll edit this all up. How's everybody doing today? Huh? You guys ready to talk about some yeah. interesting Catholic news? Me and Michael are definitely ready to talk <laughs> about some interesting Catholic news. What's our topic this week, Michael? Oh, so the Synod. Tell us a little bit about the Synod, James. Oh, I thought you were supposed to do the research. Uh, I well. guess I'll wing it a little bit. <laughs> I'm kidding, everybody. So... What we could do here on Catholicism for the Modern World is we could speculate about what the documents are going to be for the Synod. We could freak out about what the Pope's position might be at the Synod. We do a lot of the stuff that's normal for a lot of news coverage in the Catholic world. But we here we don't think that's necessarily productive. It doesn't help your faith life, and it doesn't mean anything because we don't know what the Synod is going to do until the Synod's done, whatever it is it's going to do. So we thought it'd be productive instead to have a brief discussion about what Synods are and then branch off from that discussion into a, into kind of a broader meditation on what they can mean for the church. Now, I'll provide a little bit of historical background to get us started here. So a synod would be called to have a discussion over uh, various different issues. So there were synods in Carthage, for example, and synods in Hippo, which helped set the issue of what would and would not be considered a part of the biblical canon. The goal of a synod is to come together and have interesting conversations for a fairly long period of time and then form a consensus amongst a group of bishops about what is and isn't true on this particular issue. This should not be confused with a church council. A church council makes infallible statements and is usually all of the church called together. Now, mm -hmm. to make something clear. All councils are kind of implicitly synods, insofar as a synod is a gathering of bishops. And on paper, you could use the term council and synod interchangeably, because again, both are gatherings of bishops. But what differentiates a synod and a council for the purposes of our distinction here is whether or not it makes what could be called infallible statements or dogmatic statements. Synods do not possess the ability to make such statements. They can't make dogmatic or infallible statements on the faith. They can offer the opinion and the consensus of the bishops as we have it now. No more, no less. Yeah. That's worth remembering when we go into this. Why are people freaking out about this? Why is there so much news about it? It's the top of the Catholic news right now. The Synod on Synodality. It's a really confusing name there. A Synod about Synodality. Yes, yeah, so any, any takes there? We start with the name. The reason it's called the Synod on Synodality is because the Pope, our Holy Father, Pope Francis, is under the impression that the church needs to do a better job of listening to the local public, that we need to bring subsidiarity into greater focus within the church by listening to what the general churchmen in the pews have to say, and then by listening to what the priests say about what the people want to have to say, and then the Pope reflecting on what the bishops want to say. So the Synod on Synodality is meant to not only aid in discussing various doctrinal matters, but is also meant to aid in trying to make the church more centered on listening to the opinions and experiences of the general public, rather than just being focused purely on the theological opinions 
of whoever is in charge right now. So that's the name covered. As for why people are freaking out about the Synod, first reason is a lot of people don't know what a Synod is. They haven't heard this word before. They don't know what it is. They haven't re researched it. And so implicitly, they are afraid of things they don't understand. Two, they suspect that the Synod is going to be used to slip in some kind of a change in Catholic doctrine. This generally comes from a distrust of Pope Francis and his broader agenda and a belief that he's secretly attempting to change church doctrine in some way or another. People basically take the fear they have of Pope Francis's administration as a whole and then turn that into a thing that everything he does is dangerous. The third and most important reason is that Catholic news agencies need to be able to keep the lights on. Mm -hmm. <laughs> greater issue right there like, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not, I, I just want to clarify i'm yeah. not throwing shade i'm not throwing shade at catholic news agencies you need to keep the lights on and these people are in the business of selling catholic news so they need to find stuff to talk about and this is a great thing to talk about on a long term yeah what were you gonna so ask that was my question uh, that was my next question right there you asked it yourself and answered it really like is this mm -hmm. something important is this something that will be lasting are there implications of this, effects of this that we will be seeing in the future? We can't know until they've come. Nobody knows what any document or any group of people are going to do in the church until they've done it. The story isn't over until it's over. So until the synod ends and until we see whatever documents it produces, and really, if we're being honest, until we go 250 years down the line and see if anyone's using these documents to influence anything they say, we can't know what effect it's going to have on the church. And speculating is a very, very bad idea. So we can always trust in the Holy Spirit. That's always our um, backup plan, the Holy Spirit. Plan A and our backup plan combined together. So the church <laughs> isn't going anywhere, and we aren't going anywhere either. This first show is off to a very good start, and we'll move on to the next segment. God bless everyone. Love our God is an awesome God. Our God is an awesome God. He reigns from heaven above. He reigns from power and love. Our God is an awesome God. Our God is an awesome God. He reigns from heaven above. He reigns from power and love. Our God is an awesome God. Our God. So Father Fox, he was known pretty much throughout the U.S. as the Fatima priest. I met him, we were doing some construction projects because that's what my real job is. Father was one of those type of people that he kind of demanded you do it. <laughs> so what do you think your most important contribution to the apostolate has been since you have taken over as the president? Hello everyone and welcome to this first Creator Spotlight. So we're having on a previous podcast guest, John C. Price. He is the current president of the Fatima Family Apostolate. So John, we're going to be taking a look at your apostolate. So tell us, how did you get involved with this apostolate? How I got involved was kind of a neat situation for me. And uh, but first, I'll tell you about how it originated. So Father Fox, Father Robert J. Fox is his name. He was a Catholic priest. He was based out of South Dakota. He was known pretty much throughout the U.S. as the Fatima priest. And he started the Fatima family apostolate. And he started in 1986. And what really, I think, what intrigued him to start the apostolate was with the youth at first. He's, he's seen the need to teach the youth the message of Fatima, praying the rosary, and uh, doing the first five Saturdays, and everything along with the Fatima message. So he would take, uh, I think it was like 125 youth, boys and girls, separate groups, each year for several years, to Fatima to teach them about the message, to go through and show them the sites and everything like that. And actually, a lot of those have became religious priests, religious brothers, uh, religious sisters. So it's a, it was a very uh, fruitful, 
fruitful endeavor. And so he started really seeing that after the dealing with the youth, he realized that the family was an issue. You know, there's a lot of family problems out there as we have today. We still have those issues. Mm -hmm. But with the message of Fatima, we can help families with their spiritual life by praying the rosary together as a family, by doing the first five Saturdays together as a family and really living out this message to the fullest. That's how we got started. 1986, we're still going. Uh, things have changed a lot, of course. Father passed away in uh, 2009 on Thanksgiving Day. Um, and so I got involved before that, of course. So I met him in 2003. He moved to Alabama. When a priest is 75, they put in for their retirement. Father moved to Alabama, came here by the Shrine of the Blessed Sacrament, which was built by Mother Angelica. He would do the uh, the he would do the mass at noon, and he lived right down the road here. Um, I met him. We were doing some construction projects because that's what my real job is: construction and real estate. So I was doing yeah I was I'm doing an advertisement here. I was <laughs> doing that, and uh, so I started talking to him more and more. He said, "Why don't you come visit me?" So I came and would come visit. We would talk, and uh, so that's how I first got involved with him. That was uh, just being there, you know, and talking with him. Now, officially getting involved was in 2007 when I became the vice president of the Fatima Family Apostolate. So, so that's that's how it all started. Then, when he passed away, of course, I became the president. Um, he asked me to do it. Uh, you know, it's, it's such a difficult thing sometimes to make choices and decisions. Father was one of those type of people that he kind of demanded you do it, <laughs> uh, in a sense that you're the guy, you know, our lady needs, you, you know, that kind of, uh, attitude towards it. Yeah. And I, it was something I wanted to do, you know, it was something that I really wanted to do. And, uh, it just, here I am and here we are. Mm hmm. So what do you think your most important contribution to the apostolate has been since you have taken over as the president? Wow. Well, Perhaps some, some tough questions today. Yeah. <laughs> uh, <laughs> well, I think, you know, if you'd asked me this question three or four years ago, I'd probably said a different, I'd probably have a different answer, but being older and being involved in it longer. So in the beginning, you kind of, I made some bad decisions, you know, I made some bad choices. It wasn't like, you know, morally or financial or whatever. It wasn't like that. It was just, how can I get this thing to grow? How can we get the message to the people uh, better? And so you tried things, you keep trying things, you keep trying things. And I think one of my fault and, you know, I, I, my, I went to college two years for management. So management is kind of my thing. I was mm -hmm. in, in the grocery business, I was a store manager and uh, I've owned my own businesses, but a Catholic organization is probably the toughest thing that I've ever had to deal with as far as growing, as far as uh, getting out there and getting your message out. And I think one of the things that I look back as my biggest failure in the beginning was not letting more people get involved. You know, I was trying to protect Father Fox. I was trying to protect his image. I was trying to protect my image and trying to be something that I wasn't in the beginning. And it's just very difficult, you know. So you go through those growing phases. So I think really um, my biggest contribution is learning the message better, um, learning the message of Fatima so that I can get on here and speak with you. Or I wrote three books. I have a children's book that I wrote. I have a, a prayer book that I've done, and then I have the latest book that I've done in 2017. It's called The Miracle and the Message, uh, 100 Years of Fatima. It was an Amazon bestseller when it came out. And every once in a while, when you look at these special days, like October 13th or May 13th, yeah, it's just yesterday, October yeah. 13th. If we were put into a very dark room, If our senses were all becoming very unreliable, 
We don't know what we're doing. We basically don't know who we are. There are these dark, fearful, terrifying things which are trying to seize us and doing their very best to confuse us. Family, I can see that in yourself, really, just how this apostolate has left a lasting impact in you, because yesterday you told me you had nine children. Is that correct? Nine? Actually, ten. You missed ten, one. So. <laughs> but, the, but, the, but I know what you're thinking. The, the one that I told you's birthday is today is going to be nine. So that's, uh -huh. probably where you, that's probably where you got uh, got off there a little bit. But Yeah, so happy birthday to him. To yeah, your son. his name's Luke, so Luke's yeah. birthday today. So yeah, so that's very special there. And you have the Fatima children in the back. Uh, are yeah, those like, like um, the real clothes that the Fatima children had? Actually, they are replicas, but they've been in our apostolate for over thirty years. Somebody had made them, and if you look at our old events, the children are wearing these outfits. So well, anyhow, just tell us a little bit about the museum. I think this is a good transition point into that. When did the museum start? And this okay. is in Alabama. Yes, in Hansville, Alabama. We're one mile from the shrine of the Blessed Sacrament. So if you come to the shrine, you can come see us. On the bottom level, I'm in the top level, but in the bottom level is um, Father, the life of Father Fox and his history story, the chalice that his family gave him at ordination, um, which is one of the, it was a rare one at the time. Only like three people in the world could make a chalice like that because it's like infused gold and silver. We have some of his books, like from uh, from when he was in seminary, the seminary notebooks and notes, handwritten. We have uh, the chair that he passed away in is still down there. It's kind of set up like he had the house when because he, he lived in the house. And yeah. we bought the house from the owner's father didn't own the house and we didn't ha own the house, of course. So my wife and I had bought the house. And the reason why is because it was kind of getting neglected. They had a renter in here and it was getting, they had something happen and broke windows. It was a bad situation. But so I started seeing this and I, my sentimental value, you know, my sentiment and all that with father. I said, you know what? So we bought the house. We moved into it. Of course, we outgrew it. <laughs> so we moved down the road. We live right down the road also into a bigger house. So I said, well, what do we do with this? house you know and i had a there's my neighbor is a filipino lady very prayerful lady mm -hmm. and she came over one day and she said i know what you need to do with the house i know what you need to do and i said what what do, what do you think she said it needs to be a museum for for father fox and fatima and i said well you know i kind of was thinking that myself <laughs> and so we did that 2015 is when we opened officially we're hoping to do more, add more things. We have uh, different, we have like 12, I think about 12 relics downstairs. We have like St. Maria Goretti, St. Robert Bellarmine, St. Alicia Gonzaga, St. John the Cross, St. Paul the Cross. Uh, we had the True Cross, you know, relic of the True Cross, a splinter. Yeah. So we have a lot of different relics there. Um, and so we just want to encourage everybody to come in and, just come see us. Well, I say it's a good point to end, really. Um, I'm glad this show happened a day after the anniversary of the Miracle of the Sun. So it's almost a perfect show. Uh, the Fatima message is really a timeless message. So keep up the good work and sharing that. Uh, continued prayers and blessings upon your apostolate. And so thanks for joining this first uh, Creator Spotlight, where we're going to be taking a look at creators and companies who are making a difference in the church today. So thank you everyone and may God bless you. What you worship, you love. What we're willing to worship possesses us, holds us, grasps us. Why? Because the heart of worship, this is important, the heart of worship is sacrifice. Heart of worship is sacrifice. So here you are. You'd be going to Jerusalem. 
to worship the Lord God, meaning to sacrifice what matters to you to the Lord God. Making that journey to the Lord God. Offering the lamb to the Lord God. Offering whatever grains you had to the Lord God. And your heart would belong to him because your stuff belonged to him. You sacrificed stuff. So instead, you know what we're going to do? Set up a place of worship in Dan and in Bethel, and you're going to give your stuff to this false god, to this idol. And what's going to happen, even if you don't want it to happen, is that idol will hold your heart, will own your heart, will possess your heart. And this is true for all of us. If we want to kill idolatry in our hearts, we want to make sure that God doesn't have a rival in our hearts, yes, we surrender. Meaning just, we just say, you don't even have to like feel it, just say, okay, God, my heart is yours. Perfect, great. Number two, we have a biblical worldview where we deny ourselves, have our primary allegiance to the Lord Jesus, But the third thing is, we regularly worship the Lord God, meaning we sacrifice. What do I mean by sacrifice? Not only mass, obviously. But there's three areas of our lives that matter the most to us, and they reveal what we love. Our time, our money, and our entertainment. I'll say it like this. I always... I got this from Focus. I love it. Fellowship of Catholic University students. It was the line of, what's the mark of a disciple? A disciple is someone who's willing to change their schedule to get closer to Jesus. A disciple is someone who's willing to change their schedule to get closer to Jesus. If I sacrifice my time for the Lord Jesus, man, He's going to have your heart. Don't worry. Don't worry if you feel it or not. He's going to have your heart. Sacrifice your time. And if I don't sacrifice my time to follow Jesus, not only am I not a disciple, he will never have my heart. Please sit with that. If I don't regularly, not perfectly, but regularly sacrifice my change, my schedule to get closer to Jesus, not only will I not be a disciple of Jesus, he will never get access to my heart. Number two, my stuff. I'm not saying, so therefore, it's called bull.catholic.org, so you can donate to UMD, campus ministry. Like, that's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is at some point, I have to actually, (laughs) my checkbook reveals what I love. My checkbook reveals who has or what has my heart. So my calendar reveals my heart. My checkbook reveals my heart. And lastly, I said entertainment, but what I basically mean is what we consume. What I consume has my heart. That whether the entertainment I consume, the food I consume, the alcohol I consume, the, the, uh, what I do with my free time. These three things, because I'm giving myself to those things, those three things will either kill the subtle idols in our lives or they'll feed the subtle idols in our lives. And if you and I want to be the kind of people who belong truly and fully to the Lord Jesus, that means not only do we surrender to him saying, okay, Lord, you have access. We let him be him. We deny ourselves, our primary allegiance belongs to him, but also in a practical way, my calendar reflects the fact that Jesus is the one I live for. My checkbook reflects the fact that Jesus is the one I live for. My entertainment choices, my food choices, my drinking choices reflect that Jesus is the one I live for. Because he's one who lives and loves you. You know, I, Father, I I used to work as a as a law clerk to a federal judge. And one of the main things that a federal judge does is issue sentences to criminals who have already been convicted by a jury or who have pled guilty to a crime. And there are some hefty sentences. I mean, we, we, we handed out life sentences to people. And so you see a guy standing there in the orange jumpsuit with the chains on, you know, hands and feet. And often his, his family is in the, in the audience, you know, in the courtroom, usually a mother or a grandmother, usually not a father present. And everybody is on pins and needles at that moment when yeah. the judge is about to issue his sentence. Yeah. And they've pled for mercy. Usually they've pled for mercy. 
and the criminals have a last statement and they say, basically, well, I've learned my lesson, you know, um, but the judge is going to issue a sentence and there's a, you can hear a pen drop right before that happens. And, and when they get a tough sentence, the, the family melts down, the mothers and the grandmothers, they will wail. Oh, yeah. please don't, you know, they will wail out yeah. and the criminals sometimes just drop their head and they realize at that point, there's nothing more they can say. And usually the criminals, are escorted out very quietly. They've lost. It's over. Yeah. There's no more way to yeah. to fight this. And so it's a it it is kind of a human example of what our judgment will be like. It, it is. It is a human example. And and not only will we be waiting that sentence, but all of the evidence will be on plain view mm. to to the whole of uh, the heavenly court, all of the angels, all of the saints, all of our um, beloved dead those uh, people we've loved who've gone before us and and every single um you know every single thought we've ever had everything we've done in secret um everything on our phones on our computers it will all be completely exposed mm. you know and you think if that was going to happen to to you to a person a living person right now in yeah. the year now most people would feel even even the most upright people would feel a little bit um Unconscious, a bit, a bit, you know, about secret thoughts and everything. You think, well, yeah. if people could read my mind, how would I feel? I'd be yeah. pretty yeah, embarrassed. And, yeah. But this is going to be the case. It will be before God, before all of heaven, before all of creation. And this is, I think, a great, a very sobering reminder to, to the fact that we're going to have to give account for every single thing which we do in this yeah. life. Yeah. Of course, God is a merciful judge, but he's still a judge. Yeah. Yeah. So this man on his deathbed, who uh, Akempis has created, he says the final part of that chapter, he says on 52, he says, My friends, listen to me now carefully. I implore you, know that at this moment I would rejoice more. Now, this is amazing. I just found this to be the best sentence in the whole book, Father. I would rejoice more for one of you to say a single Hail Mary for the salvation of my poor soul than I would to receive an infinite treasure of gold and silver or to be granted sovereignty over all the kingdoms of earth. Now, th I mean, th that the clarity of that thought, you know, look at how much we do in this life to obtain certain things. And this poor soul who who's fearing eternal judgment and has a sense of eternity before him would rather have one Hail Mary said for him than to have all the kingdoms of the world staggering. It is, it is. And it points to the awesome power of prayer as well, mm. you know, and particularly prayer for the deceased. Um, that we, uh, you know, people who have passed from this life before us, the efficacy, what, what this means to them, might, might seem like a tiny thing for us to say a, a Hail Mary for a departed soul, but, you know, you, we, we don't know the eternal destination of anyone. And this, uh, yeah, it's just quite staggering that he that this outweighs, and you think, well, this grace, this great treasure of grace outweighs all of these worldly things, even the sum total of this whole world together. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm.
And thus concludes the first episode of I Am Live. We will continue to produce these to make excellent and unique Catholic content all for the glory of God. So, continue to keep us in your prayers and we will keep you in our prayers as well. May God bless you and may God bless the Catholic Church.